Hey, what's up everybody? David Parsons here. This is Nostalgia Trap. Today we are continuing our series with Danny Bessner on 90s LA cinema, or movies as you might know them. And today we're talking about LA Confidential, a movie that came out in 1997, directed by Curtis Hansen. If you don't remember, this movie was huge. Uh, it was nominated for a ton of Oscars. Uh, I think yeah, Kim Basinger won the Oscar for Best Supporting Actress. Star-making performances from Russell Crowe and Guy Pearce, who were totally unknown before this movie. Um, and, and really, uh, uh, one of the only major successful adaptations of a James Elroy novel, which is why I wanted to bring on our special guest today, Will Meneker of Chapo Trap House. He's someone who has spent a lot of time thinking about James Elroy, and so has Danny. They both read a lot of Elroy's books. Uh, and both of them have a lot to tell us about the way uh, uh, Elroy's ideas and his sort of uh, insane, dark take on Los Angeles, how that translates uh, into this this Hollywood film, this, this Curtis Hansen film in 97. And there are so many different things that spin off in, uh, in this conversation, including, you know, what's happened to Kevin Spacey in the years after, etc. So I had a ton of fun talking to Danny and Will about L.A. Confidential. I think this uh, fits well into our series of 90s L.A. cinema, thinking about uh, how L.A. is transforming and how the weird movies that came out during that time tell us something that uh, I certainly didn't pick up on when I was young watching these movies. So I hope you enjoy our conversation. We've got lots more of these uh, all over the place, wherever you find podcasts. Uh, if you want our bonus episodes, we've got a lot of these uh, conversations about pop culture and movies uh, and radical politics, etc. on our Patreon uh, we're a totally independent media organization, and by that I mean we're just a couple of a couple of guys with microphones uh, sharing our thoughts. So uh, we depend on your support. If you can do that, you will get access to our bonus episodes about all sorts of stuff, uh, including more of our LA film series. Um, and we're doing a live show for the first time in October. Very much looking forward to the people who are signing up for the live show. Um, that's going to be really fun. Our first one is with Danny Bessner and special guests uh, on Back to the Future. Future. So keep a lookout for that, uh, and you can sign up for all of that stuff at patreon.com slash nostalgia trap, and we thank you a million times for the people who are supporting us. It's really fun to be uh, interacting with everyone on the Patreon. So uh, I hope you enjoy this conversation on LA Confidential. Uh, here is me and Danny Bessner and Will Meneker talking about Elroy's Los Angeles. I have no lead. Actually, Elroy was where I wanted to start because I'm not a I'm not an Elroy aficionado at all. In fact, he's someone who's just kind of like flown either what under or o over my radar. I don't know which which way it goes. But uh, <laughs> Elroy's like, um, you know, what I know about him is he's a fucking psycho and he terrifies me. And and part of that is like. <laughs> What's great about that to me is like that's exactly the kind of person who should be writing noir and crime thrillers. Um, like, like I don't want oh, yeah. like, I don't want like uh, you know Joss Whedon doing like hard boiled L.A. crime stories. I don't give a shit about that. So it seems like his whatever like nasty uh, kind of life experiences and attitudes are at the core of Elroy's character seem like they trickle into his work and and you see a little bit of that in L in L.A. Confidential the movie. But I'm sure as Will can attest, his books are even more raw oh his books are yeah they, they're 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 so much more lurid and nasty than even the movie which the movie does a really good job of capturing elroy like i think it's a really really sol solid adaptation of of his novels but uh yeah the the books are just the level of evil and just like casual cruelty and racism that he communicates in these in his books is just goes well so far beyond what the movie captures yeah why don't why don't we just start with elroy then so so david why don't you give or will whoever who is james elroy essentially where does he come from what is his shtick how did he become the ba the main author of sort of modern la noir that's a question for that's a question well, I mean, for will <laughs> well, I mean, he's an he's an LA guy. Um, I mean, he, he started out writing um, like like a series of books about um, a guy like a, like an ex cop who works at a golf course, I think, and they were a little bit like more lighthearted. But like that was his first foray into crime fiction. But uh, you know, it, it's the LA Quartet. It's it's his Black Dahlia novel, which is the first of the series of four novels of which LA Confidential is a part of. That really sort of launched him into like a completely different level of like modern American crime fiction and like in those four books you know he covers 
basically the decade of the 1950s in in LA and through like you know and then there there's always it's a, it's a it's a universe that has like overlapping characters and and interacts with real people of the era like movie stars and actual politicians but i mean he he just creates this totally panoramic view of the history of Los Angeles in the 1950s as seen through uh, primarily the inst- the institution of the Los Angeles Police Department but just like this 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 universe of like the underworld that, that connects everything and, and from like you know the highways to Hollywood to drugs the southern border it's just like in, in Elroy's books it's just like there are these like discrete and ghastly crimes that that seem separate but are united not by in any kind of like giant puppet master like like a intricately planned out conspiracy but conspiracies nonetheless that connect you know uh heroin pushing prostitution to at the end of the day it's all about land and who owns it and who controls it and like that's really what you know why his books about california and los angeles in particular i think move out of the realm of sort of crime and noir fiction into what they really are is historical fiction about Mm -hmm. like the post-war era of american history in los angeles and then eventually in his cold war trilogy the underworld usa the history of the entire country from like the late the late 50s into like the nixon era basically yeah, and I think that it's important now just, you know, as a historian, uh, but I think it's important to just situate, you know, people who are listening and, and what L.A. was like at, at the mid-century period. And, um, well, I think I've said this before in the podcast, but you probably haven't heard it, but I have a theory that L.A. is really the ultimate imperial city, particularly after 1945, and that's for v, uh, three pretty distinct reasons. Uh, first, it creates, the you know, the fantasies of the American empire in Hollywood, right? Like what the United States exports to the world about what it means to be an American, but ultimately what it means to live in the quote unquote free world during the Cold War is really what, you know, the Hollywood cultural industry does. Um, Secondly, L.A. also creates the ideas of this American empire, right? It's the Rand Corporation is in L.A., Uh, the ideas that really shape nuclear strategy, that um, shape how Americans understand psychology and what they're doing in the Cold War are really developed at the Rand Corporation in Santa Monica. And then I think... um, um, thirdly, L.A. literally creates the weapons of the American empire, right, mm-hmm. with defense contractors like Douglas Aircraft and other companies. So it's really, you know, th- this imperial city that only gets going uh, after World War II because it's in World War II where L.A.'s population actually doubles. It's sort of the gateway to the Pacific. It's the gateway to Pearl Harbor. You know, the Navy SEALs are headquartered in San Diego. They're not quite Navy SEALs yet, but you know what I mean. Uh, and so I think it's really important to understand, like, L.A why is, is writing about this period he's when he's writing about this period he's really writing about sort of the post-war american state and the post-war um american imaginary and i think this is why he's so interesting and this is why of course the movie la confidential is so interesting because it's reflecting on sort of the early history of la and of course the lapd right after the la riots right after oj right after all of these things and so that's why i think he's such an interesting author and possibly you know why he of all sort of the neo-noir people took off more than anyone, whether it's Dennis Lahan or other people like that. Yeah, no, uh, Daniel, I mean, I, I think your points about L.A. Are, are are really good. I mean, because like everyone thinks about L.A. as just the show business, right? But Hollywood pales in comparison to the defense industry in Southern mm. California. And like his books don't directly address that for the most part. But like he, he, he gets to this idea of like, you know, uh, how did we get to the America that we are now? And this idea that like, oh, like, you know, how did America lose his lose its innocence, really? But what Elroy does is just savagely undermine this idea that America was ever innocent. And Elroy loves luxuriating in and just sort of wallowing in the, 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 the evil and corruption that's always been a part of America. But like the thing is, he's not he doesn't do it from like a moral, a moralistic or kind of didactic sense. Elroy is sort of somewhat of a cranky reactionary in his own personal outlook on life. But he's someone who regards all ideologies and which are you know suffused throughout all of the LA Quartet and the Underworld USA trilogy like the whether you're an American red whether you're an American fascist whether you're like a, a, a true blue believer in democracy he essentially regards all politics as 
you know, fodder for for sickos and creeps and geeks. And that like the only the, the only people that he really respects are the people who are just purely kind of cynical operators who nonetheless maybe sometimes carve out some sense of control over their own lives and squalor that surrounds them. But um, he has a really pitiless view of American history and anyone who would sort of um, whose heart bleeds for anything like be it on the right or left. Um, and and just to build on sort of what we were talking about with Elroy as a person, I, I believe, and David, you you did some research into him, but his mother was murdered when he was a very young man, right? Yeah. M- yeah. Maybe even a child. I think he was 10 years and old. So I think like, yeah. yeah, so I think that trauma of his mother being murdered um, clearly infuses his entire uh, oeuvre, as it were. Uh, I, and it's not a surprise, right? Like The Black Dahlia is, I think, the, this first book that really, um, you know, it, it sent him into the stratosphere of popular culture. I believe he said in the in the um, introduction, in the preface to The Black Dahlia, that uh, he actually became obsessed with this murder, sort of connecting it to his mother's his mother's own um, experience, you know, with herself being, you know, uh, murdered. And I think he actually said, and Will or David, please correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't he say something along the lines that he actually had, like, you know, a fetish for women's undergarments, partially because of what happened to his mother and how he related it to this Black Dahlia so, uh, murder case? So I think there's a oh, lot yeah. going on psychologically with, like, who Elroy is as a person. And it totally, like Will said, it's exactly right, totally infused um, this entire, like, extremely cynical, extremely pessimistic under understanding of like L.A. history and um, L.A., uh, what it means to the world. Yeah. Yeah. I, in, in Elroy's own vernacular, his mother would uh, be described as either a a round heels or a semi pro. And, you know, like her her, her murder and like, you know, like uh, sexuality, like lo- looms large. Um, in his writing, for sure, and like, and certainly in his portrayal of women, and like the 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 world of prostitution, pornography, and also his own obsessions with uh, like peeping and creeping and stealing women's underwear and becoming obsessed and sort of stalking them. You see all that in L.A. Confidential. I mean, you see that in the Danny DeVito character, but also like the confluence of of sex and violence together. I mean, there's lots of scenes where that's present. I mean, arguably the whole film is about the confluence of sex and violence, but. Um, it seems like, and I wonder if, if, if Will or Danny have thoughts on this in terms of uh, noir and L.A. noir and the, the L.A. noir as a sort of um, especially you know, neo-noir of like, you know, thinking about Chinatown especially seems like a referent point with this movie and thinking about how L.A. history has been depicted on film, you know, especially when you think about like land and issues of politics and the freeways, I think of Chinatown. So I'm thinking about like L.A. Confidential and what it does that's different and the same from Chinatown. I don't know if this, if you guys would agree, but it feels like L.A. Confidential is less interested in all this stuff about L.A. politics, although it's there in the background. It feels like there's a lot more psychology there, although I, I if, now that I think about Chinatown, Chinatown's all psychology, too. And so I'm wondering how that plays out for you guys in terms of the psych, the, the dark psychological stuff um, and the way that people like Elroy connect it to the history of L.A. Well, I think that a lot well, of China's, noir in general. Daniel, go ahead. Um, so, yeah, I just think a lot of noir in, in general is essentially, a particularly noir that takes place in L.A., is is, is effectively commenting on the idea of American progress. Um, and I think L.A. Confidential talks about this a lot, you know, at, at least implicitly. Um, you know, you have Pierce Patchett investing in the 405. You have, you know, down, which I think it was downtown to the beach in 15 minutes. Uh, I, I wish that were the case. Um, it actually is true now in COVID, so it's actually kind of interesting to be in LA now and live <laughs> in the city as it was supposed to be, you know, where you actually can drive around and it's not absolutely horrible, even though that's changing. Pandemic, um, but it's also a place of social progress. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And and it's also, you know, a place of social progress, right? At least at least in theory. And they've repeatedly mentioned that throughout the film. You know, there are, you know, um, there are gay people there. It's a place where Jews first become really integrated into the power structures of the United States. Um, it's a little less true of, of black people. And we could talk about that because I think the film is a bit confused. Um, and Elroy himself is a bit confused about how to portray uh, African-Americans in, in, in this city. But I, I think what's so always so interesting about noir about L.A. is it's ultimately a comment on the American century and American progress and sort of the essentially the lies that that go into making that myth and why that myth is just never really true. Yeah, I mean, Chinatown is is sort of the, the ur text for sort of modern noir that deal with um, 
like like the, the city as a character and telling the story of a city through these discrete acts of corruption and in Chinatown's case, like sort of primal taboo of, of incest and rape. Um, but, you know, but what it's really about is water, like who's going to control the water and how L.A. sort of vampire like was able to grow by sort of stealing water from the surrounding areas. And with Elroy, it's 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 a similar vein. I mean, he's interested in in the story of America and the story of L.A. like a, a, as a place through these individual actors. But, you know, all, all of these lurid and, and uh, you know, terrible crimes and the, the, you know, fraught psychology of his characters are all really kind of places, I mean, they're what keep the plot going, but they play second fiddle to these broader acts of, uh, you know, fraud and sabotage and theft that have created the American century and the modern American city. Yeah. And Will, I don't know what you think, but like when I've read a lot of Elroy, like you have, and, um, I it, it's sort of like a miasma. It, it's almost a, a sensibility more than, you know, driven by plot. Obviously, there are these very intricate and very developed plots. But why I read Elroy is not to, you know, follow these things step by step, but to really, you know, sink into a world, sort of the, the depths of humanity, this dark heart that is at the center of Amer uh, the American promise. And I think that's why his books are so interesting and so, so cool. It's that they're incredibly difficult to understand, but they nonetheless, through their, you know, emotive language and their emotive sensibility, are able to portray something real about sort of what it feels feels like to be an American, to be constantly lied to, to be, you know, <laughs> reliant on the rapacious stealing of land, the rapacious stealing of, of water um, from other peoples. And I think Elroy, due to his incredible trauma from his own personal experiences, gets that better than most noir authors that I've ever read. And that's what is so, um, that's what makes his work, I think, so powerful, whether he's talking about, you know, the Zoot Suit riots or whether he's talking about the JFK assassination. It's all, it's all connected in his, you know, dystopic world. And he loves portraying um, um, cops. I mean, it's like, like, and then, you know, as his books go on, I mean, like the line between cops and organized crime and then eventually the American national security state gets blurrier and blurrier. But, you know, for the L.A. Quartet, it's primarily like the main characters are LAPD officers and detectives. And like he, he likes cops because they have the sort of the, the, the keys that open every door. You know, they're plugged into everything and they're the they're the they're the operators who make the real game run. And like they're they're the garbage men and the fixers and the fucking hatchet men who keep the worlds of like, you know, the, the of show business, money, politics, like, like like the keys to all of those doors. The cops, you know, tend to mind that. And in Elroy's books, it's like you're either an operator or a sucker. And then like, <laughs> like sort of geek, geeks and dopes is like he loves talking about that. He loves talking about like the geeks, like the average like like American geek or like just like some happy, well-fed dipshit or some beatnik or like just just anyone who's sort of outside of like the of this inner game of power and like money and sex and the things that really matter, like the, the people who really matter. That re and then right. and like the ultimate insiders. That reminds that me of, uh, of another film that I know is a favorite of yours, Will, is uh, Goodfellas, which is, uh, you know, a film that sort of invites you into the romance of, of being in the inner circle and 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 expressing disdain for the suckers that ride the subway uh and 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 go to work every day for a shitty paycheck that, that something like i i'm wondering because you know a little bit more both you guys know a little bit more about elroy as an author and i'm interested in kind of how ha curtis hansen like kind of translates that stuff to the screen because he takes a whole bunch of it out um, but what, there's there's certain types of cops that he seems to like uh, more than others, and it's and, and it's something about yeah. the 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 affection for a certain type of cop. It seems like even though this film is about you know Exley and Bud White, these two very different types of dudes, it seems like he has affection for something at the core of both of those characters. I, I wonder if we can talk a little bit about that. Like, what kind of cops does uh, does does Elroy like? I mean, I think you can tell, like, and in, in one of the things Elroy does so well in his novels, and I think what Curtis Hansen translates so brilliantly in the movie, is is the sense of it as a character study of three men, of, of, of White, Axley, and Vincennes. And they all start out as sort of, sort of like broadly recognizable templates in that like you know bud white is the the thug who is you know deep down inside kind of sensitive exley is just the pure ladder climber and politician the, the straight arrow and vincennes is sort of the the hollywood glad and the kind of like wannabe celebrity but like over the course of their investigations it's like the they're becoming obsessed with an investigation with finding out the truth about something with 
just pouring yourself into the details and forensics and just sort of like just day in day out scut work of being a cop and interviewing witnesses and following up on them and taking notes it changes you and like the, the, the both the violence of the crimes that you're like obsessing over themselves but also like the 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 violence inherent in the search for its perpetrators or the truth surrounding them it, it warps you in a way and changes you and the, those three characters end up in very different places than when they started but it fe in a way that feels authentic it feels like a way that they've come to it on their on their own terms or it's just like even if they haven't it doesn't feel like they're they, it, it's like some pat like they're learning a lesson it's just sort of circumstances have forced them to reevaluate the people that they are when they first started out and I think he just I think Elroy just digs on uh, just men of violence who have a kind of sensitive inner life mm. or, or or have a, have passions that are unmoored from uh, the brutality of their job. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And just to build on that, I, I think what really unites all of these characters is that in different ways, um, at least what Elroy and probably Hanson would say is that they understand what human beings really are, quote unquote, like they understand the brutality at the heart of, of, of humanity. You know, like White understands that brute force speaks. Exley understands that you need to manipulate people in order to get what you want. And Vincennes, uh, Vincennes understands sort of like the, the vice, you know, the sort of the dark impulses that drive people and how to make it in this world, you need to m manipulate them. And I think I'll worry, uh, has a very pessimistic theory of human nature. He has, you know, to, to be a little academic, he has a Habesian or Hobbesian understanding of human nature where humans are essentially prone to violence and, and decay. And the only thing that'll keep them in line is some sort of threat. And that's why I think, I don't know what you guys think about this, but I think his take on the police is almost confused because I, I on one hand in this movie, the oh, police yeah. are clear really scumbags, right? Like Meeks and Stensland and all the drunk cops who beat up the um, Mexicans are clearly scumbags. And I, I think that the movie telegraphs that and Elroy telegraphs that. But on the other hand, the cops are the hero and heroes. And there's definitely a begrudging respect for all of these people. So I think it's it's almost a confused message about whether the police are the heroes or the villains or neither. I think Elroy would probably say neither, but that they're a necessary part of, 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 the, of the story. And I, what's interesting about LA Confidential is that there really are no heroes. You know, um, Exley, I guess, and White, I guess, but White beats, you know, Lynn Bracken, and Exley is obviously a manipulative scumbag who, you know, uh, like, as David told me, uh, does the Dark Knight ending by making Dudley yeah. Smith sort of this <laughs> yeah. hero. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, like, and, and I think that's that's really interesting, sort of the, the confusion at the heart of Elroy's novel, where the sort of hard-boiled detective is not really a good guy, but he's also not really a bad guy. Do you want to have it both ways? I, I, yeah, I, I mean, yeah. I think the, 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 there's a great line early in the film when 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 Exley is telling uh, has passed his um, like a uh, sergeant's exam and is telling Dudley Smith that he wants to put in for uh, detectives bureau instead of like internal affairs or a more political um, assignment within the department as they're sort of LAPD's golden boy. And Dudley Smith says to him, uh, "You you have the eye for human weakness, Ed, but not the stomach for it." Mm. <laughs> and I, I, I think like the, the, that that gets to what Elroy's going. Like Elroy did not just does, doesn't have the stomach for human weakness. He has a sort of like a yen for it. He like I said, he he luxuriates in it. He he loves it, and like he like he and he like like being able to render that and sort of live in that world comfortably. I think he gets off on. And as to his as to his portrayal of the police and the Los Angeles Police Department in particular, I mean it it is fascinating like as a historical document. Like he really does capture the idea that like as LA doubled in size in the post war era and was even like, you know, on, on the boom before then. Like the LAPD like specifically recruited uh, white Southern men with military experience, like that was their ideal mm -hmm. recruit, as exactly. like you know, as, as like you know, to create what was essentially a to enforce the the white man's law and white man's order on what would be like, what, you know, the the most progressive, sunny, beautiful paradise of America, but nonetheless with a large African American, Mexican, Chinese, and Japanese populations, like they were there to enforce, like yeah, like the. There is no illusions whatsoever in Elroy's books, either among whatever you want to call them protagonists or villains or whatever, that like the police are white and like they are there to like basically enforce by any means necessary a kind of white supremacist order among the like lower races in, in their view. But the thing is with Elroy, he doesn't really let any 
you, you he doesn't let anyone stand comfortably no matter where your ideological preferences for something like that come because the other the other side to Elroy's books is that yeah he's showing you that all these guys are like you know are racist thugs essentially but he loves portraying like the you know black and latino underclass of LA as just like absolutely depraved criminals and like there is just exactly like, there, there is no out because like he's just showing you like the, the human squalor and debasement and evil on every single level. So it's not like he like he never lets you believe that like oh like they're just um, you know harassing and beating up innocent you know poor uh, Mexican and mm. African American people. Like he's just showing you he really loves showing you that like no like you know everybody is a rapist, everyone is a hophead, everyone is capable of the most just just debasing and just unspeakable acts of evil and murder that's a um very common attitude among police officers that just basically thinking that everyone outside of the police force is just you know depraved criminals uh involved in 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 the sorts of things that we see the 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 three black dudes that they pick up in the movie and they kind of are trying to pin the night owl murders on them and yeah, they're actually like involved in some sort of horrific kidnapping and rape, right? Like that's what's going on. Yeah. Um, but I yeah, mean, right. it's like Elroy. It's like it's like Elroy ever lets the cops off the hook because the whole point of his books is that the cops are doing the exact same right, thing. Right. Right. They're fucking. They're running. They're running child prostitution rings. They're fucking blackmailing people. They're raping people. They're fucking doing insane mass murders of innocent civilians to cover up their fucking heroin running racket. Yeah, I mean, isn't that also yeah, the, the, in, in the books? They really go into the extent to which, like, Dudley Smith is like intimately involved in like the controlling the drug distribution in L.A., but specifically mm-hmm. as a means of like racial control of like pushing mm. heroin into black and Latino communities to sort of like keep them ghettoized and keep them sort of docile and and oppressed, basically. And one should also remember just the the pure historical fact, the structural reality that uh, in L.A. in the 1940s, uh, every black person in L.A. was forced to live in about five percent of the city's um, area. Right. So like there are there are clear structural things going on that I think Elroy is reflecting in his um, in in what he says. And I, I think it's actually important to pause on sort of the fact that the, the three black men that the, um, the cops were setting up are actually also guilty of a different crime. Yeah. Um, Because I think that that's a really interesting and and almost a strange choice, uh, particularly in the wake of like the L.A. riots and the O.J. case and Mm -hmm. all of these, you know, issues that happened in the early and mid 1990s when, you know, um, there's a lot of talk about, you know, uh, police violence against black people. You have Mark Furman, of course, and he derails the O.J. trial. And then you have this movie in 1997 that comes out uh, where, you know, it actually turns out the black um, uh, the black L.A. citizens were actually guilty of raping, kidnapping Mm. and torturing a Mexican woman woman who in the in the in the book will uh actually actually becomes obsessed with right they they yeah. actually wind up dating in in the in the book um in some like meaningful ways i believe her name was inez soto in the book and it's interesting that they decided to cut that out um so it's, that goes it, to i mean it, that goes it, to will's point i think a little bit of what elroy's doing is is sort of not, he's not interested in like uh, like setting up a um a sort of moral equation like that he, do, he doesn't want to show uh, a scene uh, it, w- it would seem almost outside of the noir thing and, sp- and certainly what an LA, the, the text of LA Confidential is about if those characters were if they, they made they made it kind of a woke scene about these innocent black kids that's not what Elroy's I mean for better or worse I mean that's not what this piece of art is doing he's more like in, in, involved in sort of investigating um, that darkness at all levels of the society and yeah I mean he could have weighed that another way for sure and and I think you bring up a good point Danny which I, I wanted to ask all of us to think about which is like why was this movie so- made in 97 like why why in 97 do we go back to LA 50s noir because these movies were these movies were huge you know in the in the 40s and 50s um and, I mean and even before that I think the 30s 40s and 50s are like the prime era, era for noir um but but it, it, it's kind of out of time. And I think there was even like, uh, didn't LA Confidential like um, stimulate a little like mini genre of like gangster films? Like I, I'm thinking of like Mulholland Falls and a bunch of others. But I'm just, I'm just kind of curious what you guys think about that. Like why in the 90s are we going back to the 50s? Well, I always think it's the boomers reflecting on their parents. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's a lot A lot of what's happening in the 90s, it, whether it's L.A. Confidential or whether it's Saving Private Ryan or even in some respect, whether it's Schindler's List. Because mm. you have, you know, the end of the not the end of the empire, sorry, the end of the Cold War, you know. 
sets America adrift, right? Not only and the end of the Cold War basically coincides with boomers entering their 40s and really, you know, becoming the the cultural tastemakers in the country in a real, real way. You get the first boomer president with Bill Clinton, et cetera, et cetera. We all know this story. And I think it's basically people reflecting on the promise of America and what does America mean um, when when there's no essentially guiding logic. And this is reflected in a diversity of ways. And in LA Confidential, I think what you're what you're getting is sort of like the idea that there that there is a justice and that there is a justice that that could triumph even amongst sort of the darkness at the heart of the American project. Mm. And so it's ultimately a hopeful movie. I don't think a millennial, uh, you know, someone who, you know, grew up who was politicized by Iraq or 2008 and now Trump would necessarily say that there's ultimately a good there that, you know, despite this evil, there's ultimately like white and actually do triumph. Dudley Smith does die. Uh, well, does he die in the book? I forget. No, he does not die in the book. Right. He very, doesn't. That's very I didn't important think so. is that like uh, in, in L.A. Confidential, the book that the evil of Dudley Smith continues unabated through the next book, exactly. White Jazz, which I think is even probably Elroy's best book or, or mm. one of them next to American Tabloid. And then like you realize throughout reading White Jazz that like Exley and Dudley Smith are peripheral characters who are, are, are sort of on the sidelines of all of the action, which revolves around this. LAPD vice detective named Dave Klein. But what you realize is that like all of the, again, just insane, unspeakable squalor and violence that goes on in the book is essentially by the end you realize are just like tiny pawns and chess pieces in this gigantic epic confrontation between Exley and Smith that have been going on since LA Confidential, since the events portrayed in the movie. But uh, crucially, Dudley Smith is alive, well, and unharmed at, by the end of LA Confidential. And not only that, been like promoted, essentially. As he's even more powerful and evil. And, you know, James Cromwell does an amazing job with this role. He's really just a really fantastic villain. But the movie, Dudley Smith is like the arch villain of Elroy's works. Um, he he's shows up again and again and again, and especially now in this new L.A. quartet, which takes place during World War II. But, I mean, Dudley Smith in Elroy's writing is like, he he totally gets off on this character. He's he's dashing, he's handsome, mm. he's like Jesuit, Jesuit-educated, <laughs> uh, brilliant, sort of like almost uh, his Irish brogue and sort of like poetic wit, but is also a doctrinaire committed fascist and like almost fifth columnist during World War II, uh, an OSS spy master during World War II, and then after the war in Paraguay and Central America, read into that all you like, because believe me, Elroy does. But like <laughs> Dudley Smith is Satan himself. Like he, he is, he is Satan like frozen in the lake at the heart of Los Angeles, the city and like the entire post-war American project. Like he has his, he had, like his, his evil influence is felt th everywhere through everything, and that it all filters back to this guy and his singular like will to not 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 even just power, but just like the corruption of mankind. Will, as an Irish person, how does that make you feel? Uh, but uh, <laughs> why do you think? Why do you think he's Irish? This is a, this is a question that I that I've always had with Dudley Smith. I mean, it, they're, they're, that's a very specific choice to make him an immigrant. Um, he I is think. an immigrant. And, and I, he he uh, he catches his first body killing British soldiers in Dublin during the War of Irish Independence before immigrating to America. But like he's yeah he's catching bodies as part of like a an anti colonial struggle in his native Ireland. But he's also like a fanatically devoted Catholic as well, and like he despises Protestants of any kind. He thinks Ooh, them, key. of them as lower than dogs, essentially. Um, I think he makes him Irish because it's just like. He is the ultimate hatchet man for this like Anglo American white world, new world order. But he also has to be just a little bit outside of it as well to have the kind of perspective and like to be capable of the truly ruthless prosecution of his, his, his inner mission and what he's mandated with. That, that makes sense. And it connects to um, the idea of, of that, we, Danny, you and I talked about of, of like the, the Catholic Church being a different thing in Southern California and the Catholic Church in, in, in L.A. in particular becoming a sort of um, different mechanism and one of, uh, ironically, white supremacy in L.A. Uh, during this era. But also I, I wonder about that that ending because it was is it was Elroy disappointed with that ending because it seems like it really to me the ending really takes the guts out of the movie in some way like the the, the Exley and Bud White 
uh, give their little, you know, high five to each other and ride off into the sunset. Um, and 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 it's sort of you're sort of left with, okay, well, the good guys are going to fix everything. And it's such a different. I mean, what Chinatown is known for is its fucking dark ending, right? Like it's known. Oh yeah. It's known for like you know he gets away with it all, including murdering the girl right in front or mur- murdering Faye Dunaway right in front of everybody. And 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 that last line, um, you know, forget it, Jake. It's Chinatown. Is it, it resonates with like you're just gonna have to swallow how fucking ugly the world is. And it seems like that note is not struck at all at LA Confidential uh, at at the ending. And I'm wondering if it is in the book. Yeah, I think. No, I think that ahead. that really no worries. I, I think that that really does make it a boomer movie, and that there's still a faith in the United States. You know, in in a real way. You know, like they believe in the project. They believe in the United States. Uh, these are sort of it, it's uh, in some sense that ending is is a hashtag resistance ending, where you know, Smith <laughs> is sort of this foreign contagion uh, who comes in and fucks things up, but then like Exley uh, and and White bring it all together, and I think that's really reflective of the moment. And Daniel- is that there's still this faith Daniel and crucially actually triumphs by like playing the game because he's not going to be pure by exposing the just heinous mass murder and misdeeds of like the LA city government and police department he's going to allow them to craft a story that essentially gets them off the hook but in exchange for power within that system so like he's, he's yeah, he doesn't he's sell getting out. things he done in. yeah <laughs> and and I mean like it it does it does gut like the the really nihilistic view of humanity in America that Elroy portrays but I think it is a a wise artistic choice in a film adaptation mm. where you're telling one discrete story and you're not telling like a quartet of novels you know like so like they, they, I don't think they, unless they were planning to make white jazz right after this one it doesn't make any sense really it would be unsatisfying I think as like a distinct a discrete distinct story not to have have Dudley Smith die at the end of it. And it's just so obviously a very different a very different era in Hollywood, right? Because today everyone would be looking toward 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 making a sequel, right? So that also struck me as like the the pure um, containment of the story is you know a, a late '90s thing. It wouldn't happen in 2020 if L.A. Confidential was made today. And they actually tried to adapt it into a movie series. I sorry into a TV series. I think in 2003 and 2008, and uh, it actually was never adapted because it, which kind of sucks because I think it would be almost better you know as a series because you could get into all the crazy detail. And and have the pure cynicism and pessimism that really defines an Elroy novel. Yeah, Daniel, someday, H- one day soon, HBO will give me a billion dollars to adapt the Underworld <laughs> USA trilogy in the way it deserves to be. But until then, you know, LA Confidential is the, you know, best and one of the only few like Elroy adaptations that have made it into film or television. I think they made a pilot with Kiefer Sutherland for a TV series in 99, um, but it never it never aired, and you can watch it on the Blu-ray. They made another pilot more recently with Walton Goggins. No shit. Based on oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, but it, it never got picked up, and I think, like, you know, adapting Elroy's works now is like probably even more difficult because like how do you like how do you deal with like the racism in it? You know, like you could like look at it as one way as like he's being very unsparing and accurate about just how fucking racist the LAPD is. But on the other hand, it's like it's so pornographic in and, and you know, like it, it, the, the like like little like like touches of like wokeness or light that I'm sure they tried to weave in would just simply fall flat they would not fit at all and it would just be like who's this show for you know it would piss off everyone yeah you know uh, what's funny is uh talking about Exley and we're we're you mentioned Danny you mentioned saving private Ryan it has the same ending right like Exley has shoots the guy in the back like Exley is the little is like the um the translator that Jeremy Davies plays in saving private Ryan coward yeah right and he like (laughs) and he finds his balls like literally uh, by by shooting him in the back and and and, and like even Cromwell's character is like you know I know you won't do it because you believe in justice like you're a little bitch that believes in justice and so I can just walk away and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, in other words, the film is sort of like inviting you to like participate in that in the like exhilaration of that moment of actually like yes he finally broke the rules and shot a guy in the back. Um, and that yeah. and and that that's part of like the ending of Saving Private Ryan too is like well you know this sort of like you got to do what you got to do sometimes and that's part of the the whole sort of landscape of uh, of, of 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 the 1950s in some ways, but also of American morality. Um, I wonder what you guys think about that, but also just the masculinity issues in the film because it seems like the movie is is really about guys. Like it's a guys movie, and, and I certainly remember. You know, part of me was like, you know, we're doing this L.A. film series in part because I was young in the 90s and I watch all these movies 
and I, you know, was surrounded by a lot of a lot of my friends who were like into all this shit. And and now I'm watching them later, and I'm like seeing all this stuff that I didn't see before. And and one of the things I remember is that how much my guy friends loved Bud White. They just loved like what, how much he kicked ass in the movie. Um, how he like runs into the room and like shoves a gun in a guy's mouth and plays Russian roulette in his mouth. Like all that stuff seemed like it was like material to get off on a little bit. Um, and I'm wondering how that balances out. Like, it, it, I'm sure like, I mean, what you're, what you're saying, Will, is like Elroy does get off on this stuff in his books, but I'm wondering how it plays out in the movie because the movie's a little bit different than the, than the book. And it seems like a little more, a little more muted yet. It's, it's there. And, and there's something about men and bros in this movie. It's kind of a bro movie. I would say that if they, if they, if they adapted Elroy, I mean, I think it's, like I'll say again, I think it's a very good adaptation of Elroy, but if they, if they really went to the hilt, uh, no, no one would like watching it. Like no, no one would like imagine. <laughs> no one would like imagining that they were Bud White or any of these other LAPD cops. Mm. It, they they are just so unrelentingly nasty. And like even in like, characters that you sort of like or like, I don't even know. Like reading Elroy's books, do I root for anyone? I, I don't know. Not real. Not really. Um, because you know, essentially, what you're rooting for is just like the evil at the heart of America. But um, yeah, like if they really pushed it to the hilt, I don't think people would have that same kind of like thrill about seeing Russell Crowe like you know beat the shit out of a suspect or you know exact a kind of a rough justice. Yeah. So it would it would almost yeah. be like True Detective. It seems like. Yeah, I think I think that that's true, and and this is what I think is really interesting about the movie because I think that of of all the three characters, Bud White's masculinity is the one that's ultimately um, underlined as sort of the right masculinity in the sense that he he you know he gets the girl, he's he's smarter than everyone thinks uh, thinks he is, he's the one who really solves the case in the end, uh, even more than Exley, you know, because Exley gets that sort of cheat code with Rolo Tomasi in a way that Bud White doesn't, and it's it's just. <laughs> like a, a very different <laughs> it's just a very different vision of uh of masculinity than one i don't even think you could film that today you know because bud white of course at some point he does beat up lynn bracken and that's not even it, it's almost what was so strange to me is that the movie portrays it almost like she deserves it mm. um or it's not like a crime or it's not like a bad thing that he did because she did portray him she did sleep with exley in order to manipulate him and so i think it's a very sort of confused masculinity that that they're ultimately underlining and it's just one that wouldn't be able to be it wouldn't really be able to fly today um and what did you guys it was also interesting uh seeing this movie because you know kevin spacey plays jack vincent <laughs> oh it, it adds a I whole another seen, layer a whole another layer to his it, character of being like the 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 sort of hollywood exactly. pimp essentially yeah, um, right. The Hollywood hey, pimp, and who basically frames people for being gay, you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, and he he at some point he's like, "Who cares about another, you know, quote homo side?" Is the uh, end quote is the is the is the line that he says, and it's just it was just interesting to. Um, to watch this movie in the wake of, of what happens. I was wondering how that affected you guys or if you guys had any thoughts about, oh, you know, this Kevin Spacey star. It's, it's, it, it's so weird because when the movie came out, he was really like the only star in it. You know, like He's he was first the one listed that, yeah, in like, the credits. Like, yeah. Yeah. And like, like he was the one when the movie came out, I was like, Oh, Kevin Spacey. Cause like, you know, he was like the hottest thing at the time. And I was like, Oh, I really love Kevin Spacey. And then watching it now, it's like, cause I mean, more impressive is that this was, I think, the American film debut of Guy Pierce and Russell Crowe, who have both gone on to be like, you know, really accomplished, like Russell Crowe, like a megastar actor and Guy Pierce, like never quite as famous, but a guy who is, you know, basically good in everything he's in. Like, I'm always happy to see Guy Pierce in a movie. Oh, I but Spacey Pierce, was the yeah. only one who was like a, a bona fide, like American movie star at the time the movie came out. But yeah, just like knowing what we know about Spacey and then like the Jack Vincent's character, both in terms of like blackmailing gay men and like, just like the, the, the world of, um, uh, sort of high end prostitution and show business is, uh, really eerie considering that like, you know, he maybe uh, got Jeffrey Epstein killed and has been blackmailing the Royal family of England for like the last 20 years. So <laughs> and, uh, I would, and, I would love a James Elroy book about Kevin Spacey. Let's put it that way. And releasing really weird, uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas videos. Um, Oh the, yeah. In, in character as uh, I guess the guy from house of cards. Um, yep. But, <laughs> yeah. That's just, that are, that are, that are chock full of, 
of like weird details, <laughs> like weird little messages and coded details about like the, the queen's uh, coronation. Yeah, those and, are pain. Uh, those are really the, the bell jar and shit like that. I feel like when I'm watching those, honestly, like that I shouldn't be watching them for exactly the reason you're describing, Will, which is that they're doing some sort of black magic on me, and like the video seems literally like it's it's like pulsing with some sort of um, I don't know dark metaphysical uh, energy. That's that's oh yeah, real, yeah. Because like. I, I remember when those videos dropped, and he did. He's done them. I hope he hope he does another one this year. Me too. Uh, but when the first one dropped, I was like, "This is the most insane thing I've ever seen." <laughs> like he's pretending to be Frank Card while intoning darkly about like the forces plotting against him. But I think the thing you need to understand about those videos is that like you and I are not the intended audience for them. The fact that he released them publicly is even more insane, but like there, there's a whole second layer of like information being communicated there. And then you find out that, you know, there are photos of Kevin Spacey sitting on the throne in Buckingham Palace. Mm. So well, this is a whole other episode. Like I said, there's, yeah, a, it really is. there's it's, a series it's... of James Elroy books waiting to be written about <laughs> this era um, and Kevin Spacey will probably figure prominently in them. Yeah, but I think like what what we're getting at here, uh, it's just quickly, what we're getting at here is I think that Elroy really captures the darkness of Southern California and the <laughs> fact that basically all of America's all of America's hot people go to one city and then ninety nine point nine percent of them fail. And it's basically like chum for the sharks, right? And I think yep. Elroy really, really gets that better than anyone. Like as someone I love this city, I love Southern California, partially because it's it's just so dark. You know, it's it's always ninety five degrees and beautiful, but it's one of the darkest and most evil places in the country. And I think Palm Springs is really the heart of that. David, we should do a Palm Springs <laughs> yes. thing at some point. But I think this is this is what is so attractive about this. And but I'm also curious, you know, one of my first showbiz memories is like Alec Baldwin frantically drunk at the 97 or 98 Oscars. I forget what year it was when Kim Bassinger won the Oscar. Um, and uh, I, you know, that's one of the first things I remember. And what did you guys think of her performance? Like <laughs> having seen it, it's it's kind of almost a, a strangely muted performance. But I, I I was trying to think about what do you think people saw in it at the time that she won, you know, the Oscar, not to say the Oscars always get things right, but it was a really popular performance that I think has almost totally disappeared in the cultural imagination. As as did Kim Basinger after winning that Oscar. That's right. Right. And I mean, I, I, I think it was one of those like sort of... Uh, it was a supporting actress Oscar, and I think it was sort of given to her as a sort of lifetime achievement award because he had been, a, you know, a, a huge movie star prior to that. She's like, you know like one of the most gorgeous women like you know in movies for a long period of time but like you know never really had that oscar role and i think with la confidential it was just one of those years where they were like oh, yeah let's give it to kim basinger i mean it, it's it's a good performance but it's not it's not like an amazing one or like a you know a really memorable one even in in, in the world of the movie itself yeah, it's not memorable at all, I don't it think. It fits and into w- Another thing watch, that I wanted to bring up. It's, 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 real quick, Danny, if, it, if if you watch a whole bunch of noir movies, it, like she really does embody the tone of like a lot of the women in those movies. And I'm talking about, the, you know, the ones from the 40s and 50s. I went on like a ridiculous criterion run earlier this year and watched like 15 Columbia noir movies in a row. And, 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 and Kim Basinger feels like she's like right out of those movies in embodying that that tone. And, and Curtis Hansen did use her again as a... Uh, Debbie, Eminem's mom in Eight Mile. Just oh, to remind right. him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a really good point. I didn't even think about that. It's interesting to think about his career. But one thing that was also really interesting to me, and you know, this is my own personal obsession, and this is also true of Elroy's novels, is that. L.A. is a Jewish city, and Elroy's novels and this movie is not a Jewish movie at all. There's only one Jewish character. It's Danny DeVito, um, and they they get at it by – he says, like, boy chick, and he uses other Yiddish phrases. But that's always been interesting to me that uh, for someone who's so obsessed with a city and particularly its power elite, particularly in Hollywood, historically at least, has been, has been you know, uh, very Jewish. There's a historical reasons for this. This is historical scholarship. Uh, I'm not being anti-Semitic by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> Thanks, it's Danny. Always, uh, it's all <laughs> no. Just making it clear, uh, I study these things, uh, but it's always been interesting that 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 piece is always missing from Elroy's novels. And I, I again, it's an open question as to why that is, but it's puzzled me, and particularly uh, it struck out to me in this movie that they make a point of making Danny DeVito's character sort of this nebbishy gossip magazine, for lack of a better phrase, scumbag, um, very clearly Jewish. And I was just wondering I, if you guys had any thoughts about like, what Elroy was doing there. 
Yeah, I bet I'm sure Will has Is something he? to say about the the anti-Semitism or not there in terms of erasure or whatever. But I think Danny DeVito is like one of the most enjoyable characters in the movie. Not not just because it's Danny DeVito, but he seems like one of the most honest characters in the movie. He seems like the guy that's like literally like, I'm here to profit off this shit by making uh, by taking pictures and do and running a little tabloid magazine. I uh, maybe it's because I run a podcast that like I, I was I was rooting for Danny DeVito in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I. I yeah, I don't know if he's a. I don't know if Sid Hutchins is a likable character, but I, 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 I agree with what you said that he's probably the most honest character in the movie. He's he's the guy who has the least like illusions about himself. Next to perhaps Dudley Smith, it's just Dudley Smith doesn't advertise the truth he knows about himself. Dudley plays his cards to his chest, whereas Sid is open with everyone about like, yeah, I'm a, I'm a, you know, flesh peddler and a blackmail artist and like. You know, I'm just I'm 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 a piece of shit. But like, you know, this is Hollywood, baby. Like that's that's the business <laughs> we're in. Um, I, I do remember though in uh, in in uh, the 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 new L.A. Quartet, the World War II books. Uh, there, there there's an extended scene where uh, Dudley Smith is like sort of also on the payroll of like one of the heads of the big studios, and I think it may even be a real person that he's writing about. I forget who, but one of the yeah, like big, like big time like MGM or or. One of the one of the big executives who has like a million you know actors under contract who are treated as their you know their own personal harem and like Elroy like his his portrayal of Hollywood is essentially that actors and actresses in particular but definitely like both involved in prostitution are like the highest rung of like the sex industry that mm. like you know like the, the the chosen few will make it into movies but like to get there you essentially. Uh, moonlight as or just like work part time as as an escort like as, mm -hmm. as part of like a high, like the and the closer you are to celebrity like the higher rungs of these sort of like more exclusive sort of call girl rings uh, but like in, in his books he just even names like actual like real Hollywood actresses who he, who he's just saying are like turning tricks for powerful men. Yeah, and but particularly with Hutchins, I would say there's a vampiric quality to it. And I mean, I, I do agree. He's like very charming and very entertaining and you, and you like him. You certainly don't want him to get killed. But there's definitely like a horrible vampiric quality to everything that he does with sort of these beautiful, handsome, six foot tall, you know, uh, white, white people, white guys and white girls. And, you know, I think there's probably something more there. I mean, he's not like a Watto character, but he's also like not not a Watto character and I think that that's pretty um, interesting in what they're trying to say about sort of the, the city's relationship to the rest of the uh, the United States because they make clear that basically a lot of the people who were murdered the um, I forget the guy's name the actor Michael who, Matt Reynolds who, who Right, Matt Reynolds and uh, Sue Lefferts, they all like got off a bus, right? They all they all say that they all come to L.A. and then the city like chews them up and spits them out so much so that that they get murdered. And and there's something I think to be said about the relationship there between how DeVito is portrayed and um you know the the people that he exploits and that ultimately leads to their deaths, particularly Matt mm. Reynolds. I mean, I, I think it's just Elroy. Just like I mean, it's it's hard to miss even in an adaptation. I think just Elroy loves rubbing his readers' faces and like stereotypes and like racial racial prejudice, basically. That's interesting. Yeah. Why? Uh, wh what's his What's his deal with that? I mean, it seems it's part of it's part of kind of like. Um, I mean, is it is it is it connected to reactionary politics or is it? Li I mean, to me, it seems like it's part of like the, I don't know, the palette that he paints with, if that if, if that makes sense as an artist. I mean, I, th I think it's both. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I just think like his attitude is like, oh, if you're offended by this, it's because you're a sucker. Right. Like it's because you're, right. you're, you're naive, you know, like you're a geek, just like the, the, the faceless masses who don't matter, who aren't, you know, cops or operators or fucking, you know, hitmen or FBI agents or whatever. And I mean, I remember some interview with, with Elroy where he was just like, uh, and I think this was even like post OJ, like post LA riots, just said something along the lines of like, yeah, like this this idea that like you know cops are like this you know, uh, the, uh, he said the the idea that cops are like um, you know a ra racist psychos like acting on behalf of some sort of like covert racist conspiracy is the product of you know overheated liberal imaginations and I was like dude that's your imagination that's like I learned that from reading your <laughs> books dude it's like it's unmistakable in your books like it's it's not it's not coded at all it is just like nope the police are a racist conspiracy to oppress minorities uh, 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 run women and deal drugs like that's it 
and that, kill anyone who gets in the way of that. <laughs> that's kind of fascinating, though, that like he, he that he could like use that like real history as the backdrop and not just the backdrop, but like as the, the foreground of all these fucking stories at the same time in real life. He's like, oh, like that's a ridiculous idea. And like Black Lives Matter is based on a fallacious kind of concept that they're all racist or something. It's a kind of weird. That's a weird balance to strike. I, I mean, Elroy just seems to me like a guy um, that's sort of en enigmatic. Like, the, he, he, you can't really take a lot of what he says, especially in his public statements, um, at face value. Because, I mean, he, I think he's, like, said stuff about how much he likes Obama and how much he hates George W. Bush. And, um, and then, like, kind of uh, uh, denied he said that later. So he seems like someone that's, that's hard, to, yeah. hard, hard to read as an, as an artist. But his art um, is intense and, like, to me, reflects something really, really um, compelling about the way Los Angeles can be a setting for these types of stories. I mean, I just think it comes back to, I just think, I really think he likes sticking his finger in people's eyes. You know, like <laughs> I, I think he, he likes, he likes rubbing people's noses and things. And particularly because he's a California guy and because he comes out of the world of like writers and show business, I think he really likes offending liberal sensibilities or showing them in his works to be, you know, uh, either complete hypocrites and like just as evil as like the like outright fascists that he portrays mm. and like often as complicit in much of the same evil, but like uh, essentially are, are, are simps, are saps, are, are just are, are, are dum dums basically. Like, and on the right and left, it's like what I said earlier. It's just like there, there's really no place for you to stand if you're like come to these books with like a, a sense of like real ideological commitment. Because he's which is piss interesting you off considering I, this. This was so. This film was 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 critically acclaimed by the by that like Hollywood liberal elite. They loved this thing. It was nominated for a ton of Oscars. I mean, it. I guess importantly, we should say. It didn't win like this. Was, it was up against Titanic, and Titanic won like fifty Oscars that year. Um, but either way, yeah. it's kind of interesting what you're saying, Will, because it's like, yeah, I, I mean, I, I see all that in Elroy in L.A. Confidential, and I feel like Hansen sort of filtered it a little bit and made like a really great Hollywood version of Elroy's more intense raw novels. Um, but at the same time, it's really it's it's interesting because I'm like, did did Hansen did Curtis Hansen like wash this film so that liberals could watch it and love it? Because it seems like that's that's part of what's going on is like L.A. Confidential was embraced by liberals as like a, in, uh, you know, a, a great exploration of these of, the, of all the issues we're talking about. Yeah, I think that what Elroy's politics are, I agree with Will, they don't they very clearly don't fall neatly along an ideological spectrum, but I would phrase him as he, he really does think in some real sense that uh, America is bullshit. And I think that becomes, that comes through in the scene where they show the beginning of the construction of the four or five and the guy sort of announcing it is like, you know, there was manifest destiny and now we finally arrived in Los Angeles and we're going to be the city of the future. And of course it's building like this horrible highway that the joke line <laughs> is downtown to the beach in 15 minutes, right? And everyone in the theater laughs because that's fucking ridiculous. Ridiculous. What it is is just horrible traffic pollution and sort of destruction of land. Yeah, so Daniel, I, think that, I, I saw this um, in the theater in Manhattan, and that line got zilch. You could hear crickets in the background. People were like, "Oh, nice, I'm <laughs> on a freeway." <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, wait, like, no, wait like just, the belt just fucking here. parkway. The word four oh five. The, the word the numbers four oh five don't strike like terror into the hearts of people outside of Los no, Angeles no, because it, yeah. four oh five here to me growing up, um, you know, because I used to go uh, down to um, to. LA to see uh, LA Kings games all the time, my brothers. And the 405 was just like our torture chamber, you know, and it, and it still remains. It was the it's the crucible that all people in LA have to deal with. Yeah. But yeah. Like for the, for the, for the New York crowd like that, the, the irony of that was completely lost. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I think, I think that's right. But I think that was also made, you know, for particular viewers in mind, but I think that scene really gets across how he just thinks it's all fundamentally nonsense, that it's all a lie and it's all to make Pierce Patchett money. And actually that's a character we haven't spoken about. And I, that he's kind of an enigmatic character who I remember, I, I think, Think he's like super well played um and he's, he's really Theron interesting is a wonderful actor yeah wonderful. so really good. good he's so good yeah he's he's so great in this film in particular and i just i it's like what are they trying i guess that what that character is trying to do is he's really the center of all of these things and he brings you know the the sort of like queerness of la the prostitution the drugs together with the the funding of the infrastructure of the city and the bribing of the councilmen and everything like that and so uh, that was a really interesting character i'd almost like to see a, a pierce patchett movie or <laughs> you know, a, a yeah. pierce patchett uh, uh pre Pat patchett uh, you know, Patchett is described. He's like he's 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 like a weirdo, but he's a weirdo who has real power behind this behind the scenes. And I think there's a great line where Sid Hutchins says, uh, "Patchett is what I call Twilight. 
<laughs> he ain't gay and he ain't red. So he, he's essentially, there's no juice there for me and my sort of scandal rag, mm. which I thought was a really good good idea because obviously, I mean, he is scandal embodied. Like he, he, is, he is the heart of all corruption in LA and like the subversion of, of government, money, sex, everything. Like Patchett is at the heart of all of that, of this like shady rich guy who's like, you know, a heroin peddler and, a you know, runs a prostitution network. But like, yeah, he's not a communist and he's not a homo. So like, it's essentially boring to me. Who cares? So it's like he, he gets to skate by like entirely like an, as read for all of that, all of the evil that just falls outside the, this very tightly confined realm of like what counts as scandal or dirt. Is like that's how these guys get away with it, you know? Yeah, and basically only the innocent suffer in this movie. Like over and over yeah. again, the innocent are, are chewed up and they're spit out while the patches of the world, even though he does wind up dying in the end, but only because, you know, his connections to Smith were about to be exposed. Like the, the media, the Hutchins character. Uh, I also wonder what that name was name was originally like Hutchinberg. I thought it was interesting <laughs> that they chose like this very Hutchins name that was, again, a coded thing. But um, it, it's also really um, interesting that there's a media creator critique in that where, where he's essentially saying the media focuses on these nobodies while the real power is just totally overlooked and that, that's mm-hmm. a sophistication yeah. of an Elroy uh, of an Elroy novel where that, that, that there is a sense of like we're focused like the entire society's gaze is on the wrong thing while this very obvious mm. corruption is happening right under our nose yeah exactly and I think that runs through all his work like the, the like the the physical infrastructure of like from the neighborhoods to like the, the roads that people use to the freeways that will just funnel people into like the right neighborhoods and keep the you know certain people in the bad neighborhoods like all of it is being constructed by these like the, the this same malevolent will that nobody notices or cares about because it's not you know it, it, it's not like the uh, the right kind of dirt yeah like the, that's how they get away with all this shit and as long as we're talking about Patchett I mean it's like outside the universe of the movie but if we're talking about the universe of L.A. and the mythology that Elroy constructs I have read the uh, the first two of his uh, newer novels which are both genuinely insane but in, in it in, in it. Pierce Patchett is revealed as being part of like a fifth column network of like fascists in America who had (laughs) forewarned knowledge of like the Pearl Harbor attack and like Patchett was even giving like selecting targets on the West Coast for like Japanese submarines to fucking uh, torpedo or attack and like like the the whole these whole two the, the two books uh, Perfidia and This Storm are essentially about like American fifth columnism like at the right at the outbreak of World War II and this idea that like yeah we won World War II so it seems all like you know it was meant to be and Amer- what what America is was set and like founded before World War II and I think Elroy is trying to show you that like all this shit is up for grabs like communism yeah. fascism yeah. like it's all yep. in the brew and like basically the basically they're like horseshoe theory the novels like i mean the, the further you go into them you just realize that like all of the actors involved in world war ii but america like at some point in the war got together to figure out what we're going to do after the war to continue our evil aims be it fascism and communism working in concert i might add to like continue the subversion of like of money and drugs and power and everything and just get, to further their ideological project in a post world post war world of which everyone can see coming that like America is going to be in charge of. But what he's saying is that the America that won is essentially took over management of like the Fourth Reich or you you know, yep. Soviet totalitarianism or the Japanese imperial uh, you know co Asian prosperity spear, spear or spear. Sorry. Yeah, and I think that's what what Alroy's ultimate point in a lot of these novels is that the project is fundamentally poisoned. So it's not, it's, I, I'm going to read those books. Actually, Will, uh, now that you mentioned it, I was like putting it off, but I've read everything else. I'm going to read these books now after I finish the three body problem thing. But uh, I think that's what Elroy is ultimately saying is that the project is poisoned from the beginning. And it'd be really interesting to watch this movie in tandem with Saving Private Ryan, which is the exact opposite message. Yeah. Is that like this noble project, you know, we we sacrificed for this great deed while Elroy's like, this is what you come back to. And I actually want to mention that because in the book, Exley is actually a veteran of the Japanese theater and he actually won a medal of honor by lying, right? He he basically right, lied yeah. about killing a, a bunch of Japanese soldiers and won the medal 
uh, of honor. So what also struck out to me, it was really interesting that no one ever mentions in the book that actually is a veteran of the war. Um, and I think that was, you know, there's this sort of like quiet militarism that permeates the entire thing because they all know these tactics, right? These like very militaristic going door to door tactics when White and Exley are actually attacking, you know, um, a house, they know exactly what they're doing and they're communicating with military signals. So implying at the very least that they're veterans. And I think there's sort of this like ambient militarism that that shadows the entire thing that is never directly addressed. But is what Elroy is almost or what Hansen is almost saying is that this wasn't like the quote unquote good war that you expected it to be. It actually traumatized a generation of insane cops who go around being <laughs> yeah. racist, drunk assholes. <laughs> yeah. That's a lot yeah. more pre- that's a lot more present in those old noirs. Um you, almost every single one of them them, the male characters uh, explicitly talk about their war experience, and many of them are struggling, often in Los Angeles, uh, trying to figure out their lives afterwards and what to do with the like the trauma, but also like what to do with the violence they learned and the tools of violence. And Will, dude, you should get a uh, Stephen J. Ross on Chapo sometime. He wrote a book called Hitler in Los Angeles that goes deep into this stuff. Um, we did a show about it. Um, we didn't we didn't have him on, but we did a show a couple weeks ago, and it, it's exactly what you're talking about it talks about you know the, the, the sort of fifth column stuff that's happening in los angeles during the war but then after the war too and and it really convinces you that los angeles is sort of the 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 site of the of, of the place where where the tensions over fascism and totalitarianism continue after the war um and, yeah. and it's a battle i mean the 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 mike davis john wiener book um set the night on fire that we've been talking about on the show too la in the 60s like the 60s is a site of like all these high school kids rising up against the police rising up against the uh, anti-war uh, or against the Vietnam War um, and 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 a place where basically you know a lot of like the so-called, so-called like anti-fascist action is happening in LA in the years after World War II so it's like LA Confidential enters into that discourse I think lightly I think it's probably right in part because it's a movie in 97 that's sort of you know far away from that but yeah you can definitely feel it in the film that there's there's something um, there's a hangover of World War II that's continuing in Los Angeles afterwards. And just yeah, before, I, I mean, sorry, Will, I th- please. Uh, no, I, I think, and I think, like in Elroy's book specifically, with like now this new like World War II thing is that like he keeps going back in time to kind of like discover some like sort of like the the, the, the sort of primal original sin that like has never washed away. And I think what he's, you know, in, in ways that are both ludicrous, offensive and a historical, uh, but you know, these are novels. I mean, essentially what he's trying to say is that like uh, fascism, communism, capitalism, democracy, totalitarianism are essentially all the same thing. And that mm. like they, that no one really won or lost. And it's just like, right. it, basically it's just about how this, like this huge shipment of gold is like dispersed among these, like between Stalinists and fucking Nazis and Japanese Imperial collaborators to create this kind of stay behind network that you know births the post-war era in los angeles Mm. and then read the rest of the country do you guys think this is in any way a meaningfully end of history moment because i'm i'm thinking david talked a little bit about it about how it was such a big hit amongst liberals and you could see how it in some senses like flatters liberal sensibilities but it, it 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 the the moment of 1997 is such a, an interesting one because you basically have millennials first becoming online. It's like eight years into the end of history, four years before 9-11, um, after, you know, uh, Bosnia, before Kosovo. And I'm just, do you think it reflects the moment in any way besides just boomers reflecting on their parents? Or do you think, you know, it could have been made in 1985 or 2020 mm. and basically the same thing? I mean, I mean, it's sort of, it's sort of easy to like, you know, like, like, like reverse engineer a way to make this fit. But, you know, I'll, I'll hey, that's my job. I'll essentially I'll do it. No, um, it, it may be a little glib, but I think it's a, it's a movie about the 1950s made in the late 90s. And I think like those two decades rhyme in a certain way because like they, they're both associated with like, you know, this this broad sense of American prosperity and like progress and like things getting better that like, they, hey, like there are still problems, but essentially like we fi- like they're going to get figured out. You know, like uh, and and that like, but at the same time is always associated with this like seamy underbelly that like even though everyone is so like happy and being like yeah things are getting better like you know it, it, hey history is over America's like democracy has won or that like in the 1950s like America's confidence as a superpower after World War II is like hey like we're we're now this is our time now like America is the future as much as people enjoy that or like like to believe it. 
um, essentially it's impossible because we all are all aware in one way or another, either in ourselves or in the world around us, this deep, this deep evil that undergirds all of it. Mm-hmm. And like this sense that like it, it won't last. It can't fucking last. Like there's, there's going to be something that's going to happen. And then eventually with Elroy, it's like the Kennedy assassination. But in his whole trilogy of books about that, it's really all about how like, you know, like there is no Camelot. The Kennedys are scumbags. Like it's probably for the best that he was killed. Anyway, like, <laughs> I don't know if you would go that far. Yeah. But like, it's just like the, he, he's shattering this idea that there's any innocence in right, America right. to shatter or be like bereft of. Well, that's and, I mean, and that's that, really it. And just very quickly, and that's ver- very interesting just because the boomers so clearly have an obsession with the 50s. Like we're doing Back to the Future soon, right? And that's right. essentially a younger boomer reflecting on the 50s. And so the 50s in the boomer imagination is, I think, like a very critical object of analysis. And it, it'll probably reveal a lot about how their politics shift or didn't shift over time, as the case may be. And the, and the Rolo Tomasi thing, I mean, we can wrap it up here. I thought Rolo Tomasi might be a nice way to th- think about wrapping this up. But like Rolo Tomasi as a con. Concept. I, to me, that's the thing that, that sticks with me. That sticks with me in the movie um, is the sort sort of idea that there's a a figure that gets away with it all, and it seems like a um, that's sort of the heart of of I don't know if it's the heart of Elroy's story, but certainly the heart of Hanson's story is is that that sort of feeling of uh, of of outrage that's always kind of there uh, when there's a figure like Rollo Tomasi, and I'm wondering like who's the Who's the Rollo Tomasi of the 20th century? I mean, is it Henry Kissinger? Is it like, uh, um, I guess Epstein didn't get away with it. Epstein got, got like Pierce Patchett got got the Epstein treatment in this movie, right? Like, Yeah, he did, yeah. Literally <laughs> got like did. fake suicide. Um, but I think that concept... Uh, I David, think that, the Rollo Tomasi of, the, of, of our era is Kevin Spacey. That, that, that's kind of perfect. Or Elliot Abrams. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, no, the, yeah, like the, the Lincoln Project. It's just everyone in the Bush administration who's on like MSNBC now, you know? The, yeah, they're the, exactly. they're the Kaiser yeah, Soze. They a, they're the people who get away with it. Uh, Will, thanks so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. You should come on again and talk some more with us. Um, but this is really fun. Absolutely. Love any anytime. All right, I think that's going to do it for today. Huge thank you to my guests, Danny Bessner and Will Meneker. Really fun to talk to those guys. I hope you enjoyed our conversation. And like I said, we've got a lot more of our LA film series, uh, episodes with Justin Rogers Cooper, uh, and our live show coming up in October. So if you want to get in on any of that stuff, we really appreciate it at patreon.com slash nostalgia trap. And I hope you're doing well wherever you might be. Uh, We'll be catching up with you very soon. Soon. Take care. Bye-bye.